Paul writes to Timothy that we would know how to behave ourselves in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Please take your Bibles today, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and the message today I've entitled Keep the Faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to do a exposition really on this passage, verses 1 through 5. But as we do our scripture reading today, I'm going to read a, a few scriptures around 1 Timothy, but I'll begin in our text in 1 Timothy. If you please read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 with me, and open up your Bible and be ready to kind of flip around a little bit if that's okay. Get your fingers ready. You ready to exercise your fingers today? Little, little finger exercise, this arm. It's not working. We are having problems with it last week. I don't know, but I don't want to deal with it. Let's just, okay, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, let, read it with me. It says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, who is going to depart from the faith there? What does it say? What's the word that points to the ones who are going to depart? What is this? Does it say everybody's going to? It says some. Now, do you want to be in that song? No, we don't want to be in that song. That's the message today. We don't want to be in the sum that would depart from the faith. And that's really a theme throughout the book of 1 Timothy. So I just want to read a couple scriptures just to scan it real quick. Go to chapter 1, verse 6, and please get that and read it with me. It says in chapter 1, verse 6, from which some having, what did they do? They swerved and turned aside unto vain jangling. Do you want to be in that sum? No, we don't. We want to keep the faith. We don't want to turn aside to all the Super Bowl halftime shows of this world. It's going to be vain jangling tonight uh, in the middle. The, the game might be good, but watch out for that Super Bowl halftime. Okay, look at chapter 1. Look at verse 19. It says, holding faith and a what? A good conscience, which some, are you with me in chapter 1, verse 19? Having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So they put away their faith, and what happened? They crashed. Do you want to be in that sum? It says sum. Again, there's that word sum. Now look at, in chapter 6, just two more verses here, and then we'll pray. Chapter 6, verse 11, actually verse 10. Verse 10, 1 Timothy chapter 6, famous verse. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Do you want to be in that song? No, we don't want to err from the faith. We don't want to fall into that trap of the love of money. And the last one, the last verse of the book, just to see, I mean, it starts from the beginning to the end of 1 Timothy. He's challenging people, keep the faith. And don't be in this group of people who are departing from the faith. Last verse, chapter 6. Why don't we read the last two verses of 1 Timothy, verse 20 and 21. It says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some confessing have erred concerning the faith. Be with thee. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, teach us today to keep the faith and not be drawn away from you, dear God. We know that some in Paul's day were departing, were erring, were swerving, and their conscience had become defiled. But we thank you for, that, for the deacons that Paul writes about, and we thank you for our deacons, and we talked about that. In this series, deacons who hold to the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Help us to hold to the faith, dear God, with a pure conscience. So, Lord, teach us today your word, and may we be ready for the truth war that we are in as we face it day by day. In Jesus' name, amen.
So we are in a, we're in a war. We're in a truth war. And that's why Paul tells Timothy a number of times, fight the good fight of the faith. We are in a war over the faith, which is the truth of God's word. And so we have to fight the good fight of faith in love for Jesus Christ. And we are in a war. We see it in our culture. A proliferation of demonic activity is before our eyes parading without apology before us. Before the Grammy Awards last week, of course, where they, that's where they award the so-called best singers and songs. CBS actually tweeted before the event, we are ready to worship. They know that the world, the, the, the songs of this world, that's their worship. Even CBS said that. And so in this, in this worship service that they had on TV, Sam Smith, who calls himself non-binary, and Kim Petros, who is actually a man who has transitioned to be a woman, went out to perform their song, at least they named it right, Unholy, did you know that was the name of their song? Unholy, and it was, and it is, wicked and unholy. As Smith dressed in a red costume with devil horns, as Petros danced in a cage surrounded by flames and dancers dressed as demons. It was pure demonic Satanism in your face on CBS and they were ready to worship. They should have known ahead of time that this, that this man, Sam Smith, is a, is a total disgusting pervert. And what he did here last week in dressing like demon, a demon or a devil, is not even the worst thing he dresses as. And I can't even show you other pictures that I saw of him in, in sadomasochistic belts. It's disgusting. And yet our culture puts this out to us as this is what, no, they're coming after our children. They're coming after our children. This is pure Satanism. After CBS tweeted, nothing tops moments like these. So we are in a truth war. And we're reminded that times change, but the Bible stands. Paul was in a day where demonic activity and demonic doctrines were not just out there in the world, but they were infiltrating the church. And they are infiltrating the church. This woke ideology, that stuff that's on CBS, it's in many churches today. Many churches are embracing this kind of thing. We need to hold the line and be strong in the Lord. So in this passage of scripture, ultimately, Paul is not describing what's going on outside the church, but what's going on inside the church. So we're in a battle with an increase of demonic doctrines outside the church. The threat to the church is even greater. The church is under constant threat of satanic attack. Do you believe that? We're under a constant threat of satanic attack. Attack, we're in a spiritual warfare. So we have to realize this is just a few introductory points very quick. One, true discipleship will be costly. It will require for us to separate from the demonic and activity of the world. We have to protect our children. We cannot allow this stuff into our homes through the television, through their earbuds, through the internet. It's not going to be easy to protect our children from all of this satanic activity. But the church, the family, our children, and each of us are under spiritual attack. And true discipleship will be costly and it will require true separation from the ways of this world if we're going to keep the faith. You want to keep the faith? We have to separate, draw a line in the sand. The second thing is, man has an uncanny, uncanny tendency toward idolatry. Man will take every new technology that comes along and use it for evil. We have to be prepared for that because technology is not going to stop. They're just going to keep coming up with more technology and putting you know, uh, things on our face and, and remove ourselves from reality and, and all kinds of artificial intelligence is coming and 
and who knows what they're going to be coming up with, but it's, it's, it's on the surface, it's going to be sound good, like the technology, but it's, going to, it's always going to be used with evil purposes in mind. We have to be careful because of man's tendency. Man is an idolater at heart. He's an idol machine. Man's heart is an idol factory. Isn't that true? Man's heart is an idol factory. He just keeps inventing new idols. But thank God for the Bible. We have the Bible's power to infuse us with strength against this world. Do you realize we have a book, the Word of God and the New Testament, that was written to people who were living in a culture that Satan warred against them? So our Bible was, it was not written to people who are, you know, living on easy street. It was written to people who are literally, if they believe what this book said, they would face persecution. And many of them did. The apostles all died martyrs' death. Think of that. The first 300 years of the church, it wasn't constant persecution for the church, but there was persecution on and off throughout the Roman Empire for the first 300 years of the church. And the church grew. We have a powerful book, the Bible. And as we read, when we started the service, 1 John 5, 14, John says, I've written unto you men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one through the strength that we get from the word of God. Keep in the book, dear friends. Stay in your devotions. Have family time. Read the Bible. Memorize the Bible. Don't forsake the word of God. Look at this passage, by the way, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look what it says in verse 6, or verse 5. He says, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So the word of God and prayer. And that's, we'll get to that conclusion, but that's, what, that's where we're going to keep the faith. Through the word of God and prayer. Let's keep it simple. But that's what we got to be. In the word of God and in prayer. And by the way, that's why Thursday night we're having this very important prayer meeting, if you could come. We're going to pray with our missionaries in Australia. Isn't that cool? And in Cambodia, they've agreed to call in on Zoom and pray with us for the salvation of, of lost souls in their culture. Because we are praying for the salvation of all men. And so that's a blessing. I hope you can join us if you're free. But look, on Friday, this Friday, did I say what did I do? I said Thursday, I'm sorry. It's this coming Friday, February 17th at 7.15. Thank you, Micah. Verse 6 says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, wherein to thou hast attained. So I take that to my heart. Paul's writing to Timothy. He said, put everybody in remembrance. So I'm trying to be a good pastor. You want a good pastor, right? Yeah. Who remind you, well, I hope you'll still feel that way at the end of the sermon. <laughs> and I remind you of some things. It might make you a little mad, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, so how can I keep the faith? Paul outlines three steps for us to keep strong in the faith and to overcome these constant attacks. And the first thing is this. And we're going to just take a moment in verse one, because here is the Spirit's prophecy to the church, where Paul says there is a prophetic word of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit tells us, do not be surprised by the proliferation of these demonic do doctrines. Because he says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So the Spirit speaketh expressly means clearly and distinctly so that we understand we are living in times where demonic teachings are going to spread and snowball and even threaten the church. We have to be strong. We have to be aware. This is the devil's tactic. He wants to take over the church. That's what the devil does. He doesn't start as many things as he takes over. So the Spirit speaks. This is the Spirit's prophecy. And there's a number of things here we want to just go through in this verse. We see, first of all, the goal of 
these false teachers, their goal. What is the goal of these who are trying to get you and me to depart from the faith? Their goal. Their goal is that some of us shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits. That's in verse 1. That's their goal. The devil wants you to depart from the faith of Jesus Christ. The devil wants you to listen and, and take in the lies of this world system that is all around us. That's the devil's goal, for us to depart from the faith. Now, how many of you have heard that word apostasy? You've heard that word apostasy. Our English word apostasy comes straight from this Greek word depart. And that's basically what apostasy means. It means to rebel against the truth and reject it and therefore leave it. That's apostasy. When you fall away from the truth, where you rebel against the truth, and you reject it. And that's what was going on here. And, and that's what Paul is concerned about. That's why he wants Timothy to go to the church in Ephesus. That's where Timothy was, where Paul was writing him in Ephesus. Some were departing from the faith. Apostatizing. That's their goal, to get you to depart from the faith. Now, notice the, the, as well what it says here. It says... To, to depart from, and notice the two words after from, what are they? It's from, there's a definite article, which is important, the faith, the faith. So if you're not going to depart from the faith, you have to know what the faith is. What is the faith? He says they're, they're departing from the faith, and there's a definite article. Now, when the definite article is used with that noun faith, it's not speaking of your personal belief. It's speaking of the established body of truth that we hold dear and that we're willing to die for because that's what Christians were faced with in these early centuries of the church. And even today, Christians around the world and other nations where they don't have the religious freedom as we, they have to know, what am I willing to die for? The faith, that's what you die for. Now, I have here a picture. I found this image online. I thought it was interesting. But the idea of the faith is really founded on the Bible, the word of God. That the Bible is infallible, without error. And it's inspired. It's breathed out by God. The faith is, is that you are a man or a woman made in the image of God. God is your creator and you're, you're responsible to God. We'll all answer to God. Every one of us will bow our knee and give a, a, an answer to God one day. We're made in the image of God, either male or female. That's the faith. That's clearly the Bible. God made man in his image. He made them male and female. He's under great attack today. The rejection of creation is what many so-called Christians are departing from, from today. They're departing from their faith in believing that God is the creator, that the Bible is God's infallible word. And then it, once they deny that the Bible is God's infallible word and they deny that God is their creator, then they're off on their own. They can deny there's no miracles in the Bible. Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh. There's no blood atonement on the cross. There's no bodily resurrection, but all these things are vital to our faith. We should be willing to die for the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross and shed his blood for the sins of the world. I'll die for that. I'll die for the fact that Jesus Christ rose again bodily from the grave. You push me up against the wall, I would want to be willing to die for that. I will die for the fact that I believe the Bible is God's word and I will stand on the word of God. That Jesus Christ is Lord and that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. I'll die for that because the Bible clearly teaches these things. That's the faith. That established body of truth that we hold dear and we will die for. So why do people depart from the faith? Jesus told us in the parable, one of the early parables he gave us, in Luke chapter 8, if you want to turn there, in verse 13 of Luke chapter 8, 
in this parable of the sower in the soil and the seed that fell on the rocky ground, he describes so many I have seen through the years come to our church. They first hear the word. It seems so hopeful. They sound so excited. But then after a month or two months or maybe six months or maybe two years, this is what Jesus says often happens to many people. Will it happen to you? Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 13. It says, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. These having no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation, what do they do? They fall away. They depart from the faith. And what's their problem? What does it say? They have no root. So you've got to be rooted in the word of God and in Jesus Christ. Here's the verse. Colossians chapter 2, can you read it with me? It says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. The faith, that established body of truth that we're willing to die for. And again, we see this used throughout Timothy. I don't have time to look up all the verses with you, but I want to read just one verse. If you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want to just read about, and we're talking just about the faith again. The faith is this established body of truth. And what's interesting, and honestly, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to get what I'm saying. You just have to dig a little bit and use your blue letter Bible. But it's really neat in Blue Letter Bible. They have, uh, if you go there and you hit the interlinear line, they have like the Greek words. And most of us, we're not going to be able to read that. I can't even sit there and read that verse in Greek, just to be honest. I mean, I know certain words. But then they have the English. But then they have every word under that and attached with the, the, the Greek word and the English word side by side. And you can... You can kind of get, you can familiarize yourself with Greek. And it's not a bad thing to do that. It's at our fingertips today. But anyway, the reason I'm saying that, look at verse number 19. And this verse has the word faith in it twice. The first time he's talking about our personal belief, your personal faith in Jesus Christ. When you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved, your personal faith. Do you personally believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, that's your personal faith. On the other hand, there's the faith. That's the body of doctrine in the word of God that we believe. This verse has both the word, the first time it's used is your personal faith. The second time he's talking about the faith. And it's verse 19, holding faith. That's your personal faith. Hold on to your personal faith and a good conscience. You hold on to faith and you live out your faith, you'll have a good conscience. And then he says, which some having put away concerning the faith. Now, in our English text, it doesn't have the definite article, but it's there in the original language. The, the faith. So he's talking there about our, the body of doctrine. They put away the faith. So when you put away the faith, it's going to destroy your faith. So don't depart from the faith, beloved. Amen. Be rooted in Christ. Be established in the faith. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. So that's their goal. Their goal is for you to depart from the faith. And then the second part of their goal is that you would be deceived from the truth. So let's go back. I know we're turning. I hope I'm not losing you. Okay, take a moment. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, please. So the goal is that you would depart and then that you would be deceived. <laughs> That's the goal of these false teachers. And we're going to see them in, in a, a very clear light as well as we go through this verse. They want you to be deceived. The word deceive there literally means that you wander away from the truth. So, you know, a lot of people leave the faith of Jesus Christ. They're not, sometimes maybe they don't just set out to do it, but they just kind of like not paying attention, like wandering. Have you ever, have you ever said, oh, I've got to look something up 
and you had good intention, you needed to go to an email, for example. Maybe you needed to find an email. Also, I got to respond to that email. And you go to your computer, and then when you pick your computer up, oh, somebody texted you. So you re respond to that text, and then you say, oh, oh, yeah, there's something else here. And then you start doing that. And then you forget what you originally said. How many of you have ever done that? Okay, you wandered away from your original intention. And you just got distracted. That's how, that's how these seducing spirits want us to, to deceive us. They just want to distract you. So you just kind of lose your attention on the Lord and wander away from the thing. So let's not be deceived from the truth. And there's another word in here that's interesting in this verse. It says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. By the way, the latter times. We're there. <laughs> Paul was in the latter times. We've been in the latter times for a, a, good, a good matter of time, a good time. So we're in the last moments, I would think. But here we see their addiction. The devil and these false teachers want to addict you to the false teaching. And the word, that, why I'm saying their addiction, I'm taking that from it says where it says, giving heed, giving heed to seducing spirits. And giving heed speaks of a strong attachment to something where you turn your ears away from the truth and you attach yourself to something else. And so many people have attached themselves to social media or they attach themselves to drugs or alcohol. There's so many different addictions. Gambling is a huge problem today. Man, be careful when if you're watching a sporting event, by the way, they just like, one gambling company after another. They're just like bombarding us with this gambling garbage. Stay away from it. They want you to get addicted and wander away from the truth. Many people in this world are addicted, by the way, to the music of this world. CBS says it's time to worship. That means they're, they love that stuff. They're, they're addicted to that music. This world is addicted to the wicked music of this culture being sung by, think of this, by the most perverted kinds of people. Their addiction, and then we see their source. What's the source of these doctrines? What does it say at the end of verse? It says, by seducing spirits and what? Doctrines of devils, demons. Demons are those who are in line with Satan. They're doing the work of Satan. They're his minions. They're his underlings. They're doing his work. And remember this as well. Paul's writing Timothy. Where was Paul? Where was Timothy? What city did I say? Ephesus. Uh, just a couple years before this, Paul wrote the church of Ephesus. It's our book of Ephesians. And what did he say in that book of Ephesians? He said, stand against the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil. And he says, take on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Stand, therefore, he says a number of times. Stand against the wiles of the devil. He wrote those very words to this church, and they were, they had bought into those demons, into those doctrines. They didn't stand against him. Later on, John writes to the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Remember their chief problem? What was their chief sin? They left their first love. They departed. They departed from loving Jesus. They departed from loving the word of God. They departed from loving the truth. We're in a real spiritual battle here. In fact, there's something so amazing about these false teachers that were working to get the believers to depart from the truth. Go to 2 Timothy. I want you to see this for just a moment. Look at 2 Timothy, because really 1 and 2 Timothy go together, and this heresy that was going through the church, he continues to write about it. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 8, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Look what Paul writes there. And so here's further revelation that wasn't even given in the days of Moses when he stood before Pharaoh. But remember when Moses stood before Pharaoh, Pharaoh had his what? 
When Moses threw his, rock, his staff down and it became a snake, what did Pharaoh have? He had his magicians. Now, we don't know their names back then, but, but through time, some of their names came out to the public, and there, so two of their names are given by Paul here. These are Pharaoh's magicians who were, who were involved in Satanism. And he says the false teachers that you're dealing with in the church are just like the, the, the satanic magicians in Pharaoh's court. Can you believe it? Did you know that when you come into church, you're doing spiritual battle? Oh, I come to church to relax. I understand that. I come to church for peace. Yeah, I know. We want peace. We, we do want peace. Thank God we have the word of God. When we have the word of God, when we're staying with the Lord, we have peace. But here's the verse, 2 Timothy 3, 8. It says, now as Janus and John Brace withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning what the faith there it is wow and it was not just out there but it was coming in here so the source is their doctrines of devils and then we see their hypocritical lies so look at verse go back to first timothy chapter four look at verse two what do they see how do they see what does it say in verse two I'm trying to keep you with me a little bit here. I don't want you to fall asleep. Anybody tired? You fall asleep yet? Okay. What did it say in verse two? What do they see? Lies in hypocrisy. So in other words, their hypocritical lying was not an accident. It was intentional. It was on purpose. They were being intentionally deceptive. So we have to be aware that they lie on purpose. These who are false teachers, they are speaking lies in hypocrisy. They're not sincere. So do you know who this guy is? Do you know, do you know what religion he leads? If you are in the... Times Square train station, as I often go, there's, there's a, a man I've often seen in the years passing out flyers for this religion, and they offer a free stress test if, in case you're like burdened down with care and under a lot of pressure. You can get a free stress test through this. And here's the leader, and he has so much stress himself that he has gone into hiding. The New York Post reported on this just last month, or late January, that he is sought in a civil child trafficking suit brought by former members, and no one can find out where he is. He's hiding. He's a hypocritical liar. And this is Scientology. Whenever I pass this man, I often say to him, actually, I've said to him, a number of times over the past couple of years, I would often say, where's Shelly? <laughs> Shelly's his wife. She's been in hiding since 2007. Can you imagine me coming to church every week? Where's your wife? Oh, she's home and you can't see her. For 15 years? <laughs> I mean, I understand if she's sick one Sunday or two, you know? But so I often say, where's Shelly? And he doesn't want to talk about that. This is wicked. This is demonic. And yet people are following. And even this man that I speak to, I say, do you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, I know of Jesus. You know, they have some kind of Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. Okay. Hold on now. He is called the supreme head of the universal Christian church. According to the, the Roman Catholic system, in, a, in fact, we have no authority to even do a baptism or a Lord's Supper because that can only be done by a priest, according to the Roman Catholic system. And the Pope, which means father, he's called what? He's called Holy Father, is he? Who's our Holy Father? We have one Holy Father, our God. 
He is called and he receives this title, Vicar of Christ. You know what Vicar means? It means a, a substitute. Does Jesus have a substitute? I didn't know that. I thought there was one Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins once and for all. And he's often called the Pontiff. And this goes all the way back to Constantine, who was the Pontiff Maximus, which means the chief high priest. Pontiff is a priest. And Maximus, the chief high priest. We have one high priest who has passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. In a sermon in 2015, Mr. Bergoglio, is that how you say his name? Close enough. That's really his name. The president man who calls himself a pope. He's not my pope. But he did a message when Jesus was left in Jerusalem by his parents. You know, when Jesus stayed in Jerusalem and his parents left, he said, this is a quote, and I'm getting this from a Catholic article. So this isn't, you know, watered down by people who don't agree with them. This is from a Roman Catholic news agency, Catholic news agency, in fact, for this little escapade, and I'm quoting him, he says, for this little escapade of his parents leaving him behind, Jesus probably had to beg forgiveness of his parents. The gospel doesn't say this, but I believe that we can presume it. That's what he said. That Jesus had to beg forgiveness? That means he sinned. No. I don't believe that for one moment. Jesus is without sin. He's wholly harmless and undefiled. They're hypocritical lies. They speak lies and hypocrisy. Don't depart from the faith of the Bible and go into Romanism. That's my challenge. Their branding of these false teachers, it says having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So there's two things with this idea of being seared with a hot iron. Is One is ownership. Is that, you know, just like uh, somebody who owns a cattle, he brands his cattle and he puts his, his seal of ownership on the cattle. And that was an ancient practice. They would brand runaway or disobedient slaves, defeated soldiers or criminals. They would brand them to mark their ownership. So that could be one thing where it says they're seared. Their conscience is seared or branded with a hot iron. The idea of a branded. But secondly, it could also speak of being cauterized or being so cold-hearted or insensitive, becoming, becoming dull, becoming hard-hearted, cold-blooded, insensitive, dulled to what is right or wrong, past any feeling of guilt or sense of shame. They've, they've lived in these lies so long, they're not ashamed of their lies any longer. They're cauterized, they're hardened. They're dulled. They don't care about the effects that this will have on God's people or God's church. They, they lie without shame is the idea. Beloved, we need to have a good conscience so that when we do sin, we're under conviction. That we'll stop sinning, right? We need to have a pure conscience that gives us a sense of joy and peace when we do right. And then if we do wrong, that we come under conviction and, and turn from that sin. We need to have a pure conscience. We don't want to get hardened to the sins of this world. So all that to say, beloved, this is what the Spirit speaketh expressly. This is the Spirit's prophecy to the church. That there are false teachers who have a goal for us to depart from the faith and to be deceived. To be addicted to their false teaching. Even though the source of this teaching is the devil. And to listen to these lies of hypocrisy. and then. To follow those who have been branded with a hot iron. Mm. Secondly, we need to beware of the devil's strategy. So this is a little simpler here. But in, right at the beginning of verse 3, in this specific instance, the devil's strategy in these false teachings was leading the people of God to do what? What does it say in verse 3? To do what? The first part of verse 3. The devil wanted them to do what? Forbid to marry and commanding to <coughs> abstain from meats. You say, well, what's so bad about that? Well, that's bad. 
So what's wrong about it is the devil's strategy is for you to come under the ungodly control of these false teachings and, their fault, and these false teachers. And let me say it this way. The true church of Jesus Christ is not out to control you. Let Jesus Christ control you. Let the Holy Spirit control you. Let the word of God be your guide. The church is here to guide you, to counsel you, to encourage you. Yes, to correct you if you need correction. For us to be accountable, I'm as accountable to you as you are to me and to the leadership of our, of our church. We're not here to control you. We're here to encourage you to stand immovable in the faith of Jesus Christ, to live a faithful life, a loving life, a, a life that will bring glory to God. But it says here that, that these wanted to have some kind of ungodly control over people, forbidding them to get married and commanding them to abstain from me. So the idea, too, is, you know, we're always trying to get get a, a quick fix in something you know like a get rich quick fix idea you know people want to get rich oh okay, get rich quick scheme so the idea of commanding to abstain from me or forbidding marriage is like a spiritual quick fix scheme you want to be spiritual just do that and boom you'll be spiritual instantly spirituality doesn't happen that way and Paul talks about that, and we'll talk about that next week, where he says, exercise yourself unto godliness. There's a way to live godly, but it's not just some kind of quick fix and just stopping to do something in your own flesh. Forbidding to marry. Now, when we read those two statements, we probably think of the Catholic Church. But these two things also show that, there's, that these false teachings were pushing a path to spirituality based on fleshly works. In other words, just do this form of asceticism, okay? Uh, I hope I'm not getting too bogged down, but that's a, a, a good word for us to know. Asceticism, you know what asceticism is? It is, I don't have it there, okay. Oh, it's in your notes, actually, it's in your notes. Look in your notes, in your, in your notes there under the fleshly works. It's a severe form of self-discipline to attain spirituality or even salvation. Paul talked about this in Colossians chapter 2. We won't go there, but Paul talked about it there. He says, don't handle that. Don't taste that. Don't touch that. Just a bunch of rules. And if you follow those rules, according to the commandments and doctrines of men, you'll be, you'll be saved or you'll be more spiritual than everybody else. So these two things, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from me, isn't that a, it is kind of amazing that the Catholic Church has done both those things for a long time, yeah. Being celibate is not more spiritual than being married. Get married, you see. <laughs> you need the Holy Spirit just as much getting married and staying married as it, as it takes to be single. And to be pure. Now, both, there's, there's trials and triumphs on both. There's positives and negatives in both. So you have to pick your poison, so to speak, in this world, you know? <laughs> I know that's probably not the best way to say it. But... <laughs> that's just like a little cliche. But being celibate is not more spiritual than being married. And to forbid any person from getting married is ungodly. How could I look at you and say, you must not ever get married. If you got married, you would be out of the will of God. If I did that, I would be taking ungodly authority over you. Do you agree with that? That's what the Catholic Church has done, though. They take this whole group of people... And, you know, think of this. I love to preach the word of God. If I, I want to preach the word of God. But if I were a Catholic, if, if for me to preach the word of God, they say, I couldn't be married. But wait a minute, I love, I love my wife too. I love, being, I love the idea of being married. I wanted to get married and I'm glad I got married. And I want to serve God. I can't do both. No, not in the Catholic system. 
Marriage is not wrong for any woman. As long as a man marries a woman and a woman marries a man. No one needs to get married, though, on the other hand. If God has called you to live single, or you never find the right person, and to be single for Jesus Christ, is, is fine and a blessing too, if that's what God has called you to. But marriage is ordained of God, and it's a blessing. So to forbid marriage to anyone is wrong. So I, I did a little reading about this. Do you know one of the early Roman Catholic bishops, Ambrose, he was in the 300s. He said that married people ought to blush at the state in which they are living. Married people ought to blush in the state that they're living. In other words, they have such a negative view of marriage that even if, if you're married and have children, you should blush at, at the, what, the act that has to happen for there to be actually children. That's not the Bible. Read the Song of Solomon. Read the Proverbs about a wife, a, a husband rejoicing in his wife and her physical beauty. There's nothing wrong with the, the intimacy between a man and a woman. Actually, it says in the book of Hebrews that the bed is undefiled, it's honorable to God. I don't blush as a man with my wife. It says that Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. God says be fruitful and multiply. Guess what they had to do to be fruitful and multiply? And so, by the way, sexual intimacy did not come about as a result of the fall. That marital intimacy would have taken place without the fall in order to propagate the human race. Do you know, and I didn't know this, but during the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic system exercised such authority over people that they restricted normal marital intimacy between a husband and wife. They restricted it to five days out of the seven. If you're married, you can't have any intimacy with your wife or your husband for five days from Thursday until Monday. Ah, control. Oh, are you kidding me? Where's another church? <laughs> Did you know that? You know, and this whole, the whole system of celibacy, and I'm really not, I'm not trying to pick on the Roman Catholics on this, but it's, it's right here. I, you know, it's abstaining from meats. We think of the Friday, you know, that they couldn't eat meat on Friday for many years and then, you know, and uh, forbidding to marry. So it's an application for us. And it says it's a doctrine of demons, seducing spirits. I mean, this is serious stuff. But do you know that, that, uh, you know who Joseph Ratzinger is? He is the previous Pope. That's his real name, Joseph Ratzinger. That was Pope Benedict. Did you know he released a book after he died? He released a series of articles. He recently died. And so he released posthumously a book and, and exposed, and this is, coming from, this is coming from him now, a former Pope who knows what's going down. He said that, that homosexual clubs are operating openly in Roman Catholic seminaries. So this whole idea of abstaining from marriage, it's so unnatural, it leads people to, to do other ungodly things, abusing children, and we know all that. And, and I'm not saying that homosexuality and abuse is only in the Roman Catholic Church. It's in Bible-believing churches as well. We need to be pure, and we need to repent of that. But we need to beware of the devil's strategy. So what does it say? It says, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. So they had some strange doctrines in Paul's day, and they're strange doctrines all the time. The devil's always mixing up strange new doctrines. He says, it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Marriage is honorable and all. And another application that I thought of real quick. So here is the idea of abstaining from marriage and commanding to abstain from meat. If you do that, boom, you'll be spiritual. I was thinking of the woke ideology of today, and they say now, you know, if you really want to be spiritual, and even if you're an atheist, you have to please Mother Earth. And to please Mother Earth, you have to drive what kind of car? Not a gas car. And, it, and you have to buy, and if you buy a stove, what kind of stove are you going to buy? Not a gas stove. 
You know, it has to be electric cars, electric stove. And because of climate change activists saying that the gas of the car and the gas of the stove is going to destroy the environment and, and we're all going to die. You know, that's how the, the world is going to end. Now, listen, if you want to buy an electric car, an electric stove, that's fine. Buy it. I'm not going to say anything. It's your freedom. I believe in liberty. Enjoy your electric car. And, and I hope you'll find a place to get it charged in a hurricane, you know, <laughs> when you have to leave, wherever you got to leave. But, uh, but if you want to drive a gas car, enjoy your gas car. So lastly and quickly, embrace the divine victory. Embrace the divine victory. And I'm going to add an extra point here. So look at what our text says now in verse 3. It says, and here's the victory. God has created meat and marriage to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now notice the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So he kind of weaves three ideas in these verses and he weaves them in together. But the, the three things I see here are we must know and believe, we must know and believe the truth of God's word, that God's word is truth. As he says, who believe and know the truth. You see that in verse three, at the end of verse three? Do you believe the truth? Say amen. Do you know the truth? Say amen. The word know there is literally an intimate knowledge. So we need to believe the truth, but we are all personally responsible to knowing the truth. God's word. So if you follow this through, notice we, we talked in verse one about what? The faith. And notice the last two words of verse three are the truth. So we have the faith, which is the established body of doctrine, the truth. And then this passage concludes in verse five with the word of God. So the truth and the faith really focuses us in on the word of God. Times change, but God's word is eternal. Stand on the word of God. The second thing here, not only is God's word true, we must know and believe God's word is true, but we must know and believe God's creation is good. Look what he says. God hath created everything to be received with thanksgiving. That means marriage. That means a nice porterhouse steak. Man, I've, I, I discovered porterhouse steak. It's amazing stuff. But I also like honey. And you know what it says about honey in the Bible? It says we can eat honey. But don't eat too much of it. You'll make you sick. So there's limits to everything. I mean, I like baby Ruth bars, but I don't have them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Every month or so, maybe, I'll get a baby Ruth bar. But God's creation is good. And Paul is getting this from where? Where is he getting this from? From the Bible, from Genesis. That God saw everything that he had made, Genesis 131, and behold, it was what? Very good. God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. God has created meat and marriage in the Bible. For those who know the truth, it is very good. Create God's creation is good. You know, part of the problem in our culture is creation has been rejected. But creation is foundational to the Bible. You know the foundational verse of the whole Bible? In the beginning... God created. That's the foundation to everything else. And that's why the devil has attacked that. Because if he could attack that and get people not to believe that very first, everything kind of can crumble after it. But God is the creator and he's a good creator. And he's created good food for us to eat. Aren't you thankful? I'm thankful for steak and I'm thankful for fish too. I'm thankful for broccoli. I'm thankful for Brussels sprouts. But I'm thankful for peanuts. And lentils and beans. And there's so much good food. And we should eat in a balance. And we should be healthy. 
No one believed God's creation is good. And then the last thing here is no one believed that thankful prayer brings blessing. And he kind of weaves this into this, these last few verses. But look what he says again. God hath created to be received with, what does it say in verse 3? With thanksgiving. Giving thanks to them which believe and know the truth. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving, for it is set apart, it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So whatever you do and whatever you engage in, can you give thanks to God for it? In other words, when you give thanks to God, you're saying, God, I'm going to do this in dependence on you. Now, I know what some people might think, and I actually thought of this, like, what's, what if somebody says, well, because people say, you know, uh, what about getting high on marijuana? You know, God made the herb, so I need to receive that herb and the marijuana with Thanksgiving, you know? But are, can you actually, before, can you actually give thanks to God for marijuana and say, God, I'm not happy in my mind right now, and I really need to get high in order to really get out of my depression, but, and this is the crutch I'm going to use to get out of my feeling where I, I need to change and alter my state. You know, with alcohol or, or drugs or something. No, you can't really. So it doesn't fit into that category. Thankful prayer. In everything, give thanks. So nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. So buy an electric stove and give thanks for it. Or buy a gas stove and give thanks for it. Buy an electric car. Thank you, Lord, for this electric car. I won't have to spend so much money on gas. Buy a gas car if you want. Thank you, Lord, for this gas car. Give thanks to God for it. If you can afford a private jet, they don't make electric private jets. So you'll have to buy a gas-powered private jet and fly around with all those rich elitist climate change activists who tell us we shouldn't be doing it. You fly with them. But here's how to live the Christian life. Give thanks to God Amen. for everything. And stand on God's truth, the truth of his word. And believe that you are a man or a woman created in the image of God to bring him glory. And do not depart from the faith of Jesus Christ, but stand strong. Stand strong in Jesus Christ. And in his love. Let's stand together as we pray.